Thank you so much, Elena and Marilyn and team for having me here. Uh, one of my favorite things on the planet to do is to sit like this with small, engaged groups of people who are making amazing things happen in their communities. Because this is what's happening. Like we know that a lot of the scale of the challenges we're facing, but every single day in every nook, cranny, and watershed across this planet, 24 hours a day, folks are gathering under tents and at churches and under trees and in community gardens, <laughs> and they're talking about how they could get together and they could reconnect to their inspiration and their purpose, and they could reconnect to nature, and they could reconnect and regenerate community. And, and that's pretty much what humans have always done to adapt and thrive in challenging times, is reestablish those three core connections. And uh, I'm going to start off with a, a few quotes, and I made some notes. For about 10 years, I don't think I did a single presentation on PowerPoint, and now for some reason I do a lot of PowerPoints, because <laughs> we have a lot of images to show, and so uh, I think I've gotten hooked on my PowerPoints. So anyways, uh, you know, the first quote I want to share that I think all of you have heard is by Margaret Mead. And 13 years ago on our very first sustainability tour, starting out at Laguna Farm CSA, before there was even a daily axe, um, 70 people came together to go to a organic farm and to go to a permaculture site and a naturally built building and different activities. And so I, I said the words from Margaret Mead about never doubt the ability of a small group of people to change the world because that is all that it has ever been. And uh, I'm gonna, as Marilyn mentioned, I'm gonna share a bit of stories about some of our work, really as a, just an example of kind of what's possible through time. And I do a lot of work. I'm the founding director of Daily Axe Organization, which I'll talk about, and I'm also the board chair of Transition US, which I'll talk a bit about. And so I spend a lot of my time with just this, small groups of people who are engaged doing amazing things. And there really are a lot of us all over the planet. Um, and so, you know, most of what we've accomplished in the last decade plus has been from, you know, this, 15, 20, 30. You know, sometimes we do big events and we have hundreds or even thousands of people engaged. But a lot of times it's, it's really pretty much been this. And folks with the, the name tags and the signs who are here to help and engage. So I'm even more excited to speak with a lot of you who are already on the ground in supporting this project. And so the second quote I want to read is from Confucius. And uh, he said, to put the world in order, we must first put the nation in order. And to put the nation in order, we must first put our family in order. And to put our family in order, we must first cultivate our personal life. And to cult cultivate our personal life, we have to set our hearts right. You know, and so just getting that correct for us of, you know, it all starts with reverence in our heart. And reverence not just as this awestruck wonder in this beautiful place, this little keyhole that the whole Central Valley is energetically pouring through into the San Francisco Bay, this area that, you know, the skies are black with birds and grizzly bears and things a couple hundred years ago, this place of incredible biological and cultural diversity. Um, this is an epic place, but reverence as defined by the stately determination of makes something worthy of the materials in the moment. And at this moment with us right here, and this moment with the launch of Sustainable Backyard, and it's this big moment of, of record drought where three quarters of our state is an exceptional drought. Uh, and it's this big moment of climate disruption and species extinction and culture loss and a lot of really difficult issues to wake up to. But again, like I mentioned, of it's also this moment where people are coming together and living lives of richness and reverence and resilience and creating this handcrafted culture of stewardship and celebration. So it's, you know, to me, it's, there's never been a time um, when your choices have mattered more and there's never been a more amazing time to be alive. And so for all the difficulties and the work you do every day and figuring out how to balance with family and life and bills and, and difficult news, um, just, just coming back to, uh, coming back to that, that sense of joy and the importance of this time. So it all starts with the reverence in our heart. Uh, anybody here heard of Margaret Wheatley before? Really amazing ecologist. So one of the things that she said that helps me make sense of things and just reground into what matters when we're looking at this off the chart scale of the challenges we're facing, is she said, rather than worry about critical mass, our work is to foster critical connections. We don't need to convince large numbers of people to change. Instead, we need to connect with kindred spirits. And through these relationships, we will develop the new knowledge, practices, courage, and commitment that will lead to broad-based change. 
So starting with our heart to get the rest of it in order. Finding our critical connections. We don't have to get everybody, we just have to find, like here, the critical connections in our communities. And the third one is, uh, I, was, I was at the Heirloom Expo doing a few talks on Thursday on 9-11, and that was actually what um, a key catalyst for starting Daily Acts organization. And it was the tragedy of 9-11 and a bunch of painful things that happened around that, and then the loss of my mom suddenly a month later, that combination of personal and national crisis is what got me to actually step up and do something in a bigger way. And so some words that I read and came to me and were very soothing in the time, um, especially when there's full media shutdown and there was nothing being put out on a national scale other than consuming is patriotic. Um, and so this woman, Clarissa Pinkle is Estes, uh, incredible writer and this kind of compilation quote of a long piece she read and she said, ours is not the task to fix the entire world at once, but it's to stretch out and to mend the part that is within our reach. Yes. Because one of the most calming and powerful things you could do in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Because soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. And struggling souls catch light from others who are fully lit and willing to share it. And so starting with the inspiration in our heart and starting with living our inspiration and finding our critical connections and recognizing that, you know, we may just be able to change the world in a garden, in a backyard sustainable garden, in a front yard sustainable garden. And so out of kind of those core inspirations and reference points, um, we, myself and a few others started Daily Acts almost 13 years ago and about not the chopping acts, but the power of our daily actions, the ripple effect that your ripple could be the ripple that sparks community transfer Transformation, and that by transforming our lives and our homes and our gardens and our neighborhoods and our communities and our watersheds, we can transform our world, especially when there's whole networks of us all over the place doing this. Um, and it's about reestablishing those three core connections to self, nature, and community. And so what we do programmatically is a lot of what you're seeing here today that you are involved in. We, uh, we do presentations, we share a vision of what's possible. We say, yes, there are very painful big issues and it's an amazing time to live, to be alive and your choices matter and your community connections matter. And people come out and they wanna learn about gray water and rainwater and food forests and things. But a lot of times what's unspoken is what they're really hungry for is connection because we're missing these core connections. And then so they get connected with a community of support and peers. And then they're getting reconnected with this big planetary moment. Um, and the fact that living our potential, you know, when we, when we tap into the intrinsic force that's in each one of us, that is the core intrinsic force of life on this planet, which is to help life flourish. When we tap into that, and we're operating from that place of strengthening those three core connections, then we create conditions conducive for transformations, conditions conducive for to transform people and places from neighborhoods to nations by tapping into those core principles. And so Daily X teaches people about how to grow food and keep bees and tend community. Um, we go from doing presentations to doing sustainability tours and we go around and we'll show people these incredible gardens and these intentional communities and green built homes and it's the smell, touch and taste and the voice and face of the healthy, just world being born. And so they get inspired and connected to what's possible and they get connected with each other. And at the same time, you have this person who's fortunate enough to be on the mic getting to share their bit of the story, which hopefully we all can do because finding our voice is critical. Gotta keep things lively. Um, you know, so then we're lifting up those existing and emerging green and engaged leaders to find their voices. And great when they're an expert, renowned ecologist or author or something but even more powerful sometimes is they're just finding their voice and the words aren't all perfect and honed but they're speaking from their heart they're moving through their fear and speaking about what's important and that really empowers and engages people and in that process then we connect these networks of sustainability leaders on tours and workshops we get some media coverage for it and then we do our best to help other folks replicate these sort of models and learn from each other and so our programs from a presentation to a tour to a skill building workshop here's how you do gray water, here's how you do rainwater, here's how you sheet mulch a lawn, to uh, community mobilization, okay, let's go transform that front yard, let's go transform that public park, let's go transform City Hall, <laughs> to community challenges where we get thousands of people together to take action, just small, simple actions, 
our programs, just like within the permaculture lens, which I'll touch on a little bit, but more just share examples of, is it functions sort of like a, a, an, an edible ecosystem, an ecosystem of programs and activities that bring people in and they operate kind of on a succession from that first touch to the deeper experience, to the skill building, to the doing stuff together, to wider scale activities where a bunch of us are doing cool stuff. And so that's what Daily Acts does in essence, all around the core choice, the core belief that every choice that you make matters. And so in my other hat with, who here, do most people know about the Transition Town movement? Good number, I'll, I'll briefly mention on it. So a permaculture teacher named Rob Hopkins, you know, permaculture, this ecological design science that's rooted in the wisdom of nature and the wisdom of people who've always known how to live well in place. Ethics and principle centered. What it looks like, produce no waste, the ecological principle may be different in Venetian than Sub-Saharan Africa, but that principle is timeless and true, woven with exactness and beauty through the fabric of life. Those things happen everywhere. So that principled essence, ethics, Earth care, people care, fair share. Pretty basic, right? Like, we know how to do this. And so this permaculture teacher writes, he wakes up peak oil, peak water, climate crisis, all these issues, and he writes a book called The Transition Handbook, recognizing we're in this historic moment of transition on our planet, in our communities, and it just takes off like wildfire. And so now, you know, he wrote the book about nine years ago, and there's over 1,100 small grassroots transition groups, sustainability groups, in over 43 countries. And so one of the groups that came to the U.S. to help this spread more is Transition U.S. as a national hub organization that's based out of Sonoma County as well. And so I've been on the board for that for five years, the board of directors. And when I joined it, we had nine groups. And now there's 151 groups in 37 states. Can we join? Yes, you absolutely can. And that's even better. Local groups who are doing great work that's place-based. And then you share your models with other groups and other people start replicating what you're doing. And that's a lot of what's happening, right? It's not top-down. Down, it's the grassroots sharing their inspiration, their vision, their voice, their local programs. So all this said, I spent a lot of my time, again, with small groups of people trying to make amazing change happen. And ironically, there's about $300 billion a year that in the U.S. that goes to small grassroots groups. Well, not all of it, but 80% of it, more or less, goes to organizations under $500,000. So the vast majority of the resources are actually going to small groups. So how can we be more effective? And how can we share best practices and learn from each other and work together? Um, so that's kind of a lot of my intent. We practice permaculture where we live and have chickens and bees and ducks and rainwater and gray water and can and dry and freeze and ferment and all this good stuff that we love. Um, but, you know, how we take that out into our neighborhoods and our communities is kind of the, the focus of the work of our organization. And so, you know, one thing, let me look at the time. Okay. So just starting with this, you know, this idea of resilience. Do people here know what resilience is? Um, you know, this concept of when faced with adversity or challenge, your ability to adapt and spring back, to keep core things functioning well. It applies to a person in their life, it applies to a home, it applies to economies and ecologies. A big business goes out of business in town, what's the impact of that? A, a natural disaster, an earthquake happens, what's the impact of that? Like, how do we rebuild the resilience of our communities? And so after Superstorm Super Storm Sandy, a study was done that showed which are the more resilient and which are the less resilient communities. And what they found is that what it comes down to is maybe said slightly differently is, is trust and, and community cohesion, neighbor to neighbor relationships. Because when we're building resilience in our backyards, in our front yards, in our homes, and we're getting engaged and we're getting our own house in order, we're getting our heart in order and our house in order, and we're building those relationships and we're growing a bunch of food and saving resources, then we're also often getting engaged and we're out there at the city council meetings. Um, getting them interested in this and we're figuring how we have more local businesses and how we get a local power company like we just got in Sonoma County, Sonoma, uh, Sonoma Clean Power, the second one in the state to have a community choice aggregation. So we have local power now. And so those citizens, these small groups of people are playing a really critical role in the larger community. 
And so, you know, some indicators of that in my mind, true to your work here, is you walk down the street, our neighbors smiling and talking to each other. Do you have community gardens in your downtown? Are there fruit trees? Are there berry bushes? Um, do you have local farms? Terra at Terra Firma lives right down the street from us. I'm really thankful that they're in our community. You know, so do you have local farms? Are you working towards local power? A lot of these sort of pieces are some of the indicators that are already here and other ones that we're collectively trying to build towards in this work. And so, you know, so for, for daily acts work, our, you know, and a lot of organizations are rooted in a core few reference points. And so for me, I started, a, I was getting overwhelmed by the state of the world. And so I started looking around for solutions and I started coming across these incredible people who are doing great things and they're living in their passion and their purpose and regenerating, you know, nature and regenerating farms and things. And I didn't really have words for it, but they were, they were coming from a different place. There was something different about how they were showing up. And I didn't know what it was, but I was like, wow, that is very appealing, whatever that thing is. And so then I went to Bioneers Conference, which I recommend. Oh. Who here has been to Bioneers? Oh, I wish to go. Oh, next month you have to go to Bioneers. It's the 25th anniversary. 2,000 of us together for a weekend with some of the most inspiring off-the-chart speakers you'll ever hear in your life. Um, it it's in San Rafael, Bioneers.org. And we'll be doing a presentation and an all-day uh, workshop with them. And incredible conference. And so being immersed and not just overwhelmed, but a whole community of people who are coming from their joy and their passion, and their purpose, and they're dealing with big struggles, but they're living in vital ways and affecting amazing change. Um, and it, it's an incredible network. And so that was one of the references. Another one was these folks. And then I went to this place called the Permaculture Institute in Northern California, which I know Rick studied at the Penny Livingston. That was their place before Commonweal Garden. And I step into this half acre backyard. That was a lawn, not that long ago. Go. And the people who created this permaculture garden were saying all these great things, but like it was just this direct transmission of this vitality and this fecundity. It was this living ecosystem, and there was food everywhere, and medicine everywhere, and habitat. And they had a pond that their gray water fed and when they dug the pond they had all this clay so what do they do with the clay they make an earthen cob building and so they have art and beauty in that and they make a dragon head pizza oven out of the side of the building so you're making building community eating pizza out of the side of your building and there's living fences out of fruit trees and it was that I was like I didn't even know what it was, but I'm like, whatever this is, I need more of it in my life. And that's mainly what we've been doing for over a decade, is figuring out how to tap into that, that flourishing vitality that life has, that we all have, in words and on page and in community and in tours and in workshops. And the thing that Marilyn so beautifully quoted about Elena, showing up with that, that vitality in things. And so from there, you know, we started doing tours and workshops and activities, but you start at home. We started at home in our garden. We live on about a sixth of an acre lot, um, normal kind of urban, suburban lot. And we moved in about seven years ago and we had a lawn and we used our moving boxes to sheet mulch our lawn, not rip out the turf and take it away, which is a best practice, a worst best practice. Hi, baby girl. Nice face. Um, oh, oh, my daughter, Ella, my wife, Mary. <laughs> Um, you know, so a lot of what's recommended by water agencies around the state is ripping out the turf and taking it away. And so you're saving water, but because we're not coming from a holistic place, then it goes to the landfill where it becomes 23 times the greenhouse gas emissions as methane gas. And so you're creating a good, but you're creating all these problems and you're, you're getting rid of this precious thin skin of topsoil that makes life on our planet flourish. And so instead of doing that, we sheet mulch our lawn, we uh, start planting a bunch of things, people start giving us plants and we're mimicking natural patterns and doing keyhole beds and planting a food forest, this stacked layer mimicking an edible ecology like there's a sign over at the Benicia Community Garden site. And we have uh, about 200 varieties of food, medicinal and habitat plants. Ella eats like two or three things from the garden pretty much every week. There's always an early peach, a mid peach, a late peach, apricots, nectarines, almonds, raspberries, blueberries, uh, boysenberries, gumi berries, um, three inch Pakistani black mulberries. We have chickens and bees and ducks until recently and three different types of rainwater catchment systems and two types of gray water systems and just a lot of stuff. We grow a lot of food and medicine all while using about 60 to 80 percent less resources than average sites. So it's radically more lush, productive, and beautiful. It's saving us a ton of money, a ton of water, a ton of energy, a ton of waste. Um, it just feels better to be in, in this 
literally nature-based landscape just in your front yard in your backyard. We meet way more neighbors because of it. I used to go out and I'd pick some basil or tomatoes in the front yard and I'd have a tortilla on the stove. And I had to quit doing that because I'd burn like 25 tortillas because every single time I step in the front yard, people stop and they ask questions and they engage. One time I was reaching over and I was picking, I think some purple basil and I hear this really sweet, quiet voice. I hear, excuse me, sir. And I turn around and it's this sweet petite woman and she's in a business suit and it's like five o'clock at the end of the day. And she says, I just want to let you know that your garden makes me really happy. And so, you know, how do we create conditions conducive for this to happen? And as Toby Hemingway, a future speaker who teaches our permaculture design course, he's going to be here. He wrote a book called Guy's Garden. And in that, he talks about this point in an ecological garden when the whole system just goes pop and it surges with vitality and it's able to sift, sort, and transform any drop of water, any ray of sunshine, any bit of wind, any scrap of carbon into this thriving ecosystem of plants and animals and relationships. And so that, you know, when you start to plant these gardens, you start to get the garden to go pop. And then things start to pop in your life. And then from there, we could have the neighborhood go pop and the community and the city and the watershed and beyond. And so the core elements that he speaks to that help the garden go pop are building soil, you know, sheet mulching lawns, putting in wood chips, mulch producing plants, like building up the soil is really primary. Um, bringing a beneficial diversity of plants and animals, all kinds of, we have perennials and annuals and a zillion different types of edible flowers and vines and all kinds of things. Beneficial animals, bees and chickens and ducks, um, bringing in habitat for other critters, right? When we're planting these plants, there's, there's more other pollinators and critters coming through using green and natural building and greening our buildings as well. And then the fifth one is the human stewards. It's our role, right? It's not just about nature. We are a part of nature. And so when we're doing this, we are becoming more aware, engaged, conscious stewards. And so those are the elements that help us, just like the program elements that, that you all are gonna be doing, that help a garden go pop. So then how can we apply that to our neighborhood? How can we help our neighborhood go pop? So we partner with the city of Petaluma. Um, one of the things we do is a, a, a we have a lot of water conservation contracts with local municipalities and the water agency. And so we come in through water and then we do all these other permaculture things. And so I was sitting with a water coordinator, city of Petaluma at our house one day and hanging out in the garden, you know, and giving him food and stuff. And then uh, I said, Dave, we should plant a food forest. And he's like, what's a food forest? And so I started to explain you know, the seven layers of this edible ecology, again, like that materials over there and just mimicking nature again, mimicking nature. And so we went across the street to the Kavanaugh Center Boys and Girls Club and his boss wasn't super into the idea yet, but he's like, okay, save water. And so over three days, 150 volunteers came out, 80, 85 degree heat, and you know, not spring chickens as well. Like we had folks in their 50s and 60s that are digging in clay. And his boss, the head of the water department, comes over on this weekend and he's walking there with his family and he's kind of stunned looking. He's sort of like, it's super hot out. People are digging in clay. They're smiling like crazy. They're just having an amazing time, whatever it is they're doing. And he's like, what is this, you know? And so through that, we dropped water use, conservation, water conservation. That's why we were doing it for the city, 70, 80%. But then we also kept all the materials on site and mulched those materials. And we dug swales, these water harvesting ditches. We did swale trails. So you walk on it in the summer and in the winter, it soaks in the storm water. Now there's new state stormwater requirements. It doesn't come with any funding for the cities to actually do anything about it. But we've been doing stormwater with, for them since day one. They hired us for conservation, but it's like, well, we'll cover stormwater and we'll cover community engagement and we'll cover food and we'll cover medicine, we'll cover habitat and we'll train people on these things, get them connected, get them inspired and help them better utilize your, your municipal incentive programs, which will help you kind of transform and be more ecological. So after that, then we went next door and the neighbors that live next to them, Lori and Murray, they didn't want to, ch they wanted to change their garden, but there's a lot of barriers, a lot of challenges. They were feeling a falling down brick wall and not having resources and this and that and the other. And so we brought out 30 people over a span of, uh, you know, four or five hours and we rapidly transformed their garden. And we just turned problem after problem after problem into delectable, edible, beautiful, creative, artistic gardening. And they said it felt like the day they got married. And Lori talked about how it's changed their values and their 
they're purchasing things different. And the neighbor connection piece, every single person that walks by their landscape stops and talks to them and asks questions. And that's a theme in these things that we see again and again and again. So then we went to City Hall. And in 2009, we installed a permaculture food forest and sheet mulched a bunch of turf at City Hall with two other organizations. And we had 250 people came together and transformed a, uh, almost an acre of turf in a day. Saved the city a million plus gallons of water a year, saved them $60,000 in installation costs. It was 350.org's first day of international climate action. So it was part of the largest day of community-based action in the planet's history. And now we have Chilean guava berries and community garden beds and rainwater catchment tanks and kiwis and uh, artichokes at City Hall that you could go harvest, right? This is public food for the most part. The community garden beds are assigned to people. And so there's something about doing this in the halls of power and in relationship with the city government and saving them money and saving them water, not complaining at them about what's wrong, being like, well, here's what we're gonna do about it. We're gonna save you all these resources and get your community engaged and inspired. And so out of that, the city of Petaluma created a program called Mulch Madness from that first lawn we sheet mulch doing it the way nature does instead of ripping out and taking away. And I need to get new numbers from the city, but as of like over a year ago even, they had provided free resources to sheet mulch over 500 lawns, which saves the city 20 plus million gallons of water a year. And even more than those 500 dots on the map in the city of Petaluma, two, three neighbors in each street are starting to do it. And we, I go down any street on our side of town now and there are two, three, four front yard gardens. And you, you're starting to see a cultural tipping point and neighbors start connecting with other, other neighbors. Um, and, you know, and, and other people are moving in because they're drawn to this sort of energy. That's it, Sweepy? Oh, thank you. By the way, I need a lot. Oh yeah? <laughs> um, and so then, you know, right, and you start to look around and it's creating this tipping point and then so we start to work with other cities and we just transformed Sebastopol City Hall with some great partner organizations, Permaculture Artisans and Permaculture Skill Center and the city of Sebastopol. And uh, do you wanna sit up with me, sweetie? Or are you gonna move around? And so then we're doing people-powered parks all over the community. And there's, we have, um, we worked with 30 students in the town of Windsor and installed a public food forest and in the town of Katadi and actually helping the municipal agencies transform these sort of programs. And you will get paid a dollar a square foot in the city of Katadi to install a food forest in your yard. So rather than just less bad, rather than just pure water savings, which is important, but it's like, okay, if we're just talking about water that comes out of the tap, but what about your water footprint? Even if you let your lawn die, if you're eating a factory farm steak every day, that is a mass amount of water. If you're, if you're washing five glasses a day instead of just refilling one, there's all these other things that add to our water footprint. And so the importance of having these more holistic concepts and that what we're doing in our backyard, that can be applied at city council, that can be applied at county, that could be applied at state policy because they're ecological design principles that scale up. And so even when we're doing these small things together, they have a much bigger ripple as well. And so the last piece on the program side is that Five years ago then, well before that, we started doing gray water work as well. And we installed the first permitted single household gray water system in Sonoma County. And mimicking nature again, we installed a constructed wetland gray water system. That, that you know, it does what a wetland ecology does at the edge of a bay, like it treats the water turns waste into food, that kind of thing. And so Ella's bath water goes into our gray water wetland that then goes and feeds the goji berries and the Asian pear and the kiwis. And then we eat those and then we prune the trees and then we put them in the pizza oven that we made digging the swales across the street at the public food forest with kids dancing in the clay and having fun, no power tools. And so then we heat up the cob pizza oven in the backyard and then we feed our family and friends and neighbors and strangers and mayors and we've had Congressman Huffman playing music and eating in our backyard and getting these high-level elected officials, the head of our water agency, county supervisors, Mike McGuire is likely going to be our next senator, you know, getting these folks going, okay, we could do this differently. You know, small scale, at scale, nature-based, community-powered. Um, these solutions can apply at a larger level. So we went from doing that to working with the county and gray water action um, and a small group of people that actually helped influence the California state gray water policy. 
So then when we came back and we start working with our cities, and then we did, from one system, we did five in our neighborhood in a, in a day. And then we did 13 in two cities in a weekend. And then we did a 100 gray water system challenge and getting the cities to collaborate, helping them with their incentive programs. And again, just one player in this, not the only one, but you know, showing that sheet mulch. And we go from one yard to 500 to thousands. We could go from one gray water system to 100 gray water systems to policies. Um, you know, we could go from one public landscape that's saving water to a public food force, to a city hall, to another city hall, to another city hall, to community gardens. And there's a new organization moving into the Kavanaugh Center across the street from our house, and they serve 300 at-risk youth. And so then starting to do programming with these youth and teaching them about healthy food and how nature functions and how we can use this to transform our homes and our gardens and our neighborhoods. Um, so we're really excited to do more with youth as well. And then we do a thing which would love when you all are ready to take on as well as the Community Resilience Challenge. And so five years ago, because there's a lot of need, right? You know, so we're like always trying to figure out how can we bigger things, but at the human scale, at nature scale. And so we had this crazy idea of planting 350 gardens in a weekend. And we got together, and we got our cities on board, and we the water agency came in as a big supporter, and schools and churches and businesses. And again, like we didn't really have to do it all. It's the right effort in the right place at the right time, and anything's possible. And so we just issued a challenge, and we supported people to be a part of this healthy and this just and this resilient vision. And people showed up, and they stepped up, and organizations and churches planting rows for the hungry. And together we planted and revitalized 628 gardens in Sonoma County. Mainly around one weekend, and we got you know Sonoma compost donated free compost. To everybody who signed up and gave free resources to um, underserved community gardens and things. And so this is something. And Sustainable Contra Costa, you know, then they heard about this challenge. And Tina from Sustainable Contra Costa came over at one point, and we were in the backyard, you know, in the garden, right? And we we're pruning and grafting fruit trees. And I was just telling her about the stuff we were doing. I was like, here, take it, run with it. And she did, and this small organization, Contra Costa, within months, they turned that into a thousand community garden actions and, and home garden actions. And then they doubled that the next year. And then this last year we partnered on it and they registered in the East Bay over 8,000 actions and collectively registered over 17,000 actions to grow food and save water and conserve energy and build community. And this is a program one person could do, a small group of people could do. You register all your actions, but you talk to your neighbors and friends and it gets in the local paper. Suddenly there's like all the cool things that are happening they're standing up and they're being counted. Shared vision, shared voice, shared results. And then other people going, wow, what's that? That's pretty amazing. And then the local electeds and sustainability commission's happy because, you know, it's they're doing good things with their dollars, but then other folks are standing up and it's building political power and it's building business power. And so that's the power in a place of having our shared vision, our voices. And then when as communities of small organizations, you know, Daily Acts here, um, your garden projects here, sustainable backyard, when we start to work together and collaborate and network and share, and we become a part of this larger movement, that isn't just like neat things happen all over on their own, but in a shared language way, in a shared measurables way, then we draw a lot more power and potential and a lot more resources to support the expansion of this sort of work. Just checking my timing. I get talking quick about a lot when I'm inspired, so I'll wrap up shortly. Um, you know, and so, so just looking at and thinking about, and, and this leads to other great activities as well. When these folks, you all, were engaged, you know, you start to meet other people doing this work and you get involved in other activities. And we're a founding member of the Sonoma County Food System Alliance, which is looking at how do we have a healthy, just food system, you know, one that is socially equitable and economically viable and cares for the earth and cares for our farmers and produces healthy food for people. And so we created a, a food action plan that's been adopted by our county supervisors. And so I'll be at three different council meetings in the next month, sharing that with the councils, getting them ideally to endorse and adopt it, highlighting what's working in their communities. And again, another vehicle, not just in our day to day, right? There's the work we do in our homes, our organizations, but how we collaborate, which I love about today. And I know multiple organizations are making this happen. And so working together and we, you know, work to support Sonoma Clean Power in a lot of these efforts. And that's a lot of the important we do work we do, not just on 
education and action than on these official and unofficial alliances. It's like that's how we transform our communities. You know, it's bigger than any one of us. So when we collaborate and support each other's efforts, and it may start out small, but through time, it starts to build momentum and it builds and it builds and it builds and the stories that come in are off the charts. There's a garden in Petaluma. Some folks found out about our programs and they got involved and they wanted to transform their backyard, but they didn't live there. They live in San Francisco, really great folks. So they, some daily actors moved into their place and transformed their garden into a permaculture landscape. And we had a garden wheel. A bunch of volunteers get together and they support each other in these backyard systems. You know how to garden and you know how to cook an amazing lasagna and you play beautiful music and you know how to do plumbing and alone, you know, we may have some of the bits, but together we have food and we have music and we have hard work and we have vegetables and things to share. And so volunteers came and helped them transform this garden. And then the owners hire another daily actor, a local businesswoman, to install their gray water system. And then she invites this other friend to our big fundraising breakfast, Rip of the World, where we get 600 of us together on October 31st, Halloween. If any of you want to come to Sonoma County and be with 600 people doing this stuff, from elected officials to organizers to schools to churches, you name it. Um, and so then this woman is sitting in the audience, this woman who got invited, right, the Ripple, and she's sitting there and she's listening to one of our volunteers on the stage who, and she's telling a story about how her life's been transformed since she showed up at the corner of one of these public gardens and started volunteering. And since she installed her own front yard garden and her front yard gray water system, she's met more neighbors than in two decades of living in this house. And she's been on the cover of the paper twice, probably the only one I know in a span of months. And she's a very shy, quiet woman. And all of a sudden she's out there engaged and she's talking to neighbors and things are happening. And so this woman, Nancy, is sitting in the audience listening to her story and she's like, ah, that's it. Like it just touched her heart. She's like, yeah, sustainability interests will want to do it. And so Nancy and her husband, Jim, go home and the Community Resilience Challenge happens. This big challenge, this call to action. This is one of 7,000 local actions. I was at their house on Thursday. And they're, you know, they transform their front yard with this great permaculture organization called Weaving Earth. They do permaculture and regenerative design work, nature-based work. And so these students come out, and that's this whole other set of benefits. These students are learning these skills, job skills they're getting hired to do. They transform a front lawn, saving 16,000 gallons of water a month between sheet mulching the front lawn and installing native habitat medicinal food, um, reducing water use in the back. They put on community benches right in the front of their garden. They put in a free lending library. And so now they come home and little girls are reading books on their benches and eating strawberries, books from the free library. So they heard Judy say that they wanted that to happen. They did this three months ago. They've lived in this neighborhood for three decades. They've met more neighbors in the last three months than in three decades of living in this house. And that's what happens. Like you hear these stories again, and it kind of astonished me. I'm like, really, are you kidding me? Like more neighbors than in a year of living there in two decades and three months? It's kind of, it's almost comical that you just add water conservation. You just add food, you just add medicine, you just add habitat. You just create conditions conducive for nature and community to regenerate. And these astonishing things happen. One of their neighbors told them that, she said they feel like they live next to celebrities because all these cars slow down in front and they stop. And this is the same thing that I see again and again in our neighborhood and other neighborhoods. It just, this is just actually what happens. And it's what gonna happen here when you're doing backyards and then someone migrates to the front yard. The same thing is gonna happen. And it's pretty astonishing, you know, that these, these small efforts can lead to such significant change in a home, in a garden, Garden, in a neighborhood, in a community. And uh, so I think, you know, I'll, I'll more or less close there, but just going from these simple permaculture based programs, a thing you do in your yard to get your garden to go pop, and then you talk to some neighbors, and you help out of the church, and then we get our neighbors to go pop, and we start working with the cities, and we start aligning the incentive programs, and working together, and the businesses, and the schools, and the churches, and it all just happens very naturally. People wanna do good things. And the communities start to go pop, and then when we get to connect with each other, and share, and we're, I asked for Elena for the grant, I'm like, wow, that's an amazing way to frame that up, an acre of public food. You know, what you're already doing has already influenced us, even though we've been doing it for a long time, and that's the beauty of it. It's like, 
like we go back and forth. Exactly, right? <laughs> Decentralized, localized, nature-based, people-powered solutions. And so I just feel really honored to, one, get to share some of our work. And, you know, and this is, I always call it sustainable hedonism and selfish altruism. Right, hedonism not as in living in service for pleasure that a lot of the way our culture is right now, greed and consumption and material base, but the pleasure of healthy food and the pleasure of community and the pleasure of being a part of something larger and being in your inspiration. And then the selfish altruism, this is what you this is who you get to hang out with. You get to hang out with really great people who are raising their kids different and they're farming different and they're growing different and they're doing their business different and they're doing their councils different and their activities. Um, you know, and so just super thankful to get to share the work that a ton of hands have helped make happen. Our city partners, our business partners, our volunteers, our staff, our board, just the people that just show up like you all are.